I think maybe in a creative field where you work for yourself to set time limits are really yeah. good because we were just going on and on with our labels. And finally I said, today's the day. I'm just, we're sending it out. And, and even to the, the final hour we were doing little like, you know, you just have to stop. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today, we are speaking with Linda Myers, who runs Wary Myers. Am I saying that right? Yes, you are. Wary Myers, along with her husband, John, who's off camera giving moral support. Maybe yes, we'll have is. him on another time. I hear he's a, he's a really good uh, abstract artist, as well as uh, creative behind everything that you guys are doing as well. Uh, their company produces playful soaps, candles, and lip balms that are considered by many to be design objects more than anything else. <clears throat> Uh, and you guys brought me a gift bag, and I'm super stoked about that. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Wary Myers started out in Brooklyn designing interiors for their friends and artsy types. After a magazine column for Time Out New York and a book, they relocated to Maine, decorated their own Portland apartment, which would grace many magazines and countless blogs. Feeling the desire to make a tangible product, they've taken their design sensibilities and fused them into enticingly scented candles and soap soaps which they hand make in their Cumberland home working in an attached former beauty salon built for the previous lady of the house in the 80s I like the combination of lady of the house and 80s that that doesn't get thrown together often yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design don't miss Meyer's design theory in the upcoming July issue of Maine Home Design thank you for coming into the studio today Linda Myers my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for going through a, a portrait. It's never, never fun having your portrait taken unless, yeah. I don't know if you could do it skydiving or something. Maybe that'd be better. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I think my son has taken the best, he's 11. He takes the best selfie of me. Well, not a selfie, but he takes, maybe I'm at most at ease with. Yeah. I'd imagine there's I, something in that connection of relationship that just puts everything in your face at ease and you're yeah. just, you're just channeling this you know, I was expression joking of with him. I said, let's bring you today, but we had his <laughs> just two days right at school <laughs> for the week. Are you so. doing a lot of homeschool and stuff during COVID or were you lucky enough to have a school that was still in session somewhat? Or? Um, we have two days a week and he's been in a pod for the other three. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's been okay. We've gotten we've gotten through it. Cool. So give me give me a little background on on your company and what you're doing, your 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 background and and what led you into it. Because when okay. when Danielle said, Hey, like I told you earlier, <laughs> when she said, Hey, we have some uh candle makers and uh soap makers that we think would be interesting, I I thought <clears throat> Maybe we're not the typical candle soap makers. No, maybe. not at all. I, I was like, really? You want me to? Uh, hmm, okay. But then I looked at your work and I was like, I I want the things that these people make in my house because these will be like, mo like if I go into the bathroom and it's my bathroom, but I see your guys' bar of soap, I'm, my day is just going to be a little brighter and more fun because of that. It's, it's really cool. And anyone Thank who's you. listening... Uh, what what is the website where they it's, go and find your stuff? It's wearymyers.com. Wary my so yeah. go there and check it out and you'll see what I'm talking about. It it Thank feels you. like back to the future soaps and candles and everything kind of collected from the sixties through the nineties in a pop yeah. art way. It is absolutely really fun. You so. nailed it. <laughs> That's really can we hire you to uh no um, I'll be the voice of your marketing. <laughs> please. Um no, that's pretty much exactly right. Um John and I started out, we were we kind of well, we did interior design in New York. Um and we decided we wanted to leave New York. And my parents lived on Long Island in Maine, um, off Casco Bay. Oh, okay. And cool. um, I was visiting, and I thought, what a great place to go move. And and I was in advertising, um, in design and advertising, and was ready to get out. So I just started thinking about Maine, and John was on board, and. We thought, okay, let's do it and let's figure out what we can do to make a living when we actually get to Maine. So, um, you know, we we wrote a book and um, based on things we found on the street and we kind of rehabbed and reinvented and 
redesigned and it was kind of, we called it Wary Myers Tossed and Found. And then from there Did again, we you say we're Tossed and Found? Tossed and Found. Oh, I because like that. when I, we lived in New York, we would find things on the street, fix them up. And we had a column in Time Out New York magazine called Tossed and Found. So, um, Oh, that's the book cool. came from there, and um, the column was really great because every week um, we had to find something and fix it up, and we would just get really, really abstract and so far removed from the original thing, that uh, the original assignment of just kind of making something a little better. And so it, it branched off into a book, and, and then we were kind of like, we got to Maine and we were like, what do we want to do and how do we make a living in Maine? Um, so you did the book where you, while you were still in Brooklyn? No. Well, no, we did it in Maine. We okay. did it when we moved to Maine, but it was still technically we were supposed to be in New York when we did mm -hmm. it. But we did it from Maine. And, and, um, and when did you guys move to Maine? 2000. Uh, John? 2000, 2004? John. 2004. Oh, wow. Yes. Same. I, yeah. I think pretty much same year as us. Yeah. Yeah. It still feels, it's weird. It feels like it just happened, but yet it seems like an eternity all in the same like Yes. Ball. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a like, really weird thing, especially when you start seeing your kids, you know, get older and you look around at people you think you look the same age as, and then yeah. you realize like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got do some start. gray. What's going on? <laughs> I know. I still feel like. I definitely feel like I'm still in my 20s right. for sure. So, yeah. Well, the odd thing for me is last March when COVID started, like af like during January, February, and March, I matured. I really? And at the age of 44, I all of a sudden realized I wasn't a kid anymore. It took really? me a long time. <laughs> but like, I don't, I feel good about it. I don't feel like, oh, like, yeah. but it's weird, like- before that, I constantly thought of myself as the youngest person in the room all the time or like something like that. But that's so interesting. Something about that time frame, like right before and during that there, maybe it had something to do with my kids getting to an age where I interacted with them far more enjoyably because they got to an age where you could talk and reason with them. And it put me in a different place of responsibility or something. Maybe yeah. I don't know. But I mean, I'm, you know, I'm still wearing checkered socks and vans and trying to go to skate parks with my kids, thinking I'm still young and can bounce off of concrete when I shouldn't. But that something happened in the last year that like I became an adult in you my grew 40s. Into yeah, I think the opposite happened with me. Really? Actually. <laughs> yeah, actually it did. I said when COVID hit, we have a we have an alternative lifestyle in that we always work from home. We're very, we're very, we're kind of in our own little whole bubble anyway, because we work from home. We work mm -hmm. for ourselves. We have a fantastic woman who comes and helps us out a couple times a week. And but this other was than, all before COVID. That before you were COVID, from home. during COVID, oh. our life really didn't change that much. Yeah, so me, when, me <laughs> so when COVID hit, I kind of was like, I could either complain about beyond being worried about, you know, getting COVID and all of that. I, I thought I'm going to make this a positive experience. So I decided I was going to get in shape and do all the things that I, you know, always say I'm going to do and I'm never going to do. I bought a trampoline, a mini one, and I started doing that. And I just started working on myself. I, I stopped, not that I ever really drink that much, but I just cut out alcohol, tried to cut out sugar. I just tried to, and it's so not me if you know me. I'm not that healthy type person. I mean, I am, but I, I just decided that I was going to have it be like a sabbatical almost and, mm -hmm. and kind of like a cleanse. And <laughs> like a sober 2020. <laughs> yeah, but an enjoyable one, like one that I, I want to come out of feeling better. And it's so weird. I do. Like, I feel like I'm coming out of it like ahead of the game or so. I don't know. I feel like I'm coming out of this like and I'm ready to to like start new this year. I don't know. It's it's very <laughs> strange. I feel like I I, I um transformed through COVID in some huh. weird ways. Maybe because we're already so much in our little bubble that I'm like, okay, now we're going in even deeper. So let's just like 
go for it. Right. And, and, and so, and creatively too, more importantly, I guess for our business, creatively, I went mm. within myself. And how, do, how does creative marry with business for you? I like, think it's one and the same at this point. Um, but I mean, I business think... has all these things that you you cannot be creative with. Like you can't you can't imagine money, and you can't. Im- That's been like, the hardest thing. Pretend in our to business. pay your rent, or you can't. But you have to use this idea of or this process of creativity to actually make real, uh, real you know, money to in return, but you have to get this, this world of valuing things, uh, to come to you through, you, know, you picked up junk off the street and made it valuable. Right. And, and got cash in return. Right. Like that's a, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess being in any art, you know, deciding to go into art and make money is never easy. And I mean, yeah, I guess. Go, going into art to make money is like the worst idea ever, but it's probably the best way to live for the people who know they have no other way of, well, no other option. Like, and, this is what I have to do. There's good and bad because it's kind of like when, I guess you could look at it like, When you're young and you work at an ice cream store Mm -hmm. and you love ice cream and you go and you get that ice cream, you get the job, your first job at Ben and Jerry's and you're like, you never want to eat ice cream again. (laughs) I guess you can kind of look at that in life and anything you do. Like if you do it for a living, the joy will be taken out. There is just, it's just, it will, but the joy will be gained back in other ways. Like you know, creatively being your own boss, not Mm -hmm. having to like answer to the person you don't want to have to answer to in the corporate world. But then there's, you know, a give and a take, um, you know, your social life isn't that great. Um, when you work for yourself, because you're always working, you could always be doing something else. And when you ask, you know, where do you draw the line between creative and your life? And I, I honestly would say there is no line drawn between exactly. our life and our business at all. Mm-hmm. It, it's the same. Yeah. And therefore, when you're creative and you're trying to figure out how to make money doing it, and, and when John and I got married, John's never worked for an office. He's never worked at, mm. an, at a desk before. My John, dad. I worked in a pallet factory. <laughs> Oh he's, man. He, he's so I mean, when we got married, I was like, okay, I've got to figure out. I I mean, I could still go ahead and work at a desk. I was um Oh, really? You could do that? Well, I mean, I was a designer in an ad in various ad agencies in New York. So uh-huh. it was not your typical. I wasn't going and working, say, for an insurance agency. I was working in a creative field where people all kind of had the attitude that we're creative and we're cool and we mm-hmm. can do so you kind of, it, it was a little different that type of experience but moving to Maine marrying John I had to figure <laughs> I had to figure out we had to figure out quickly to stay here what could we do right you know so um talk to me a little bit about what what your uh experience with creativity like I I've spent a lot of time trying to contemplate what creativity really is, why we have it as a species, and why we seem to be so incredibly fascinated with it as in any society. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think the more creative you are, the less you think you're being creative, almost in certain ways. Like, I don't think I define even myself as being creative. I just think I'm being, I'm not saying I am or I'm not, but I don't think I define it in that way at all. I just think maybe some people might think, maybe they think I'm weird. Maybe they think I go, you know, I definitely don't follow the norms of how other people live their life. You know, maybe my son comes home and is like, oh, my mom is a little different than the other moms. I don't know. I'm never really embarrassed around people. I never really care about what people think of me all that much. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's all kind of part of creativity. But in the end, I don't think it's definable because it could be anything. You could be creative in the way you cook. You could be Mm -hmm. creative in the way you 
set up your house or, you know, paint a painting right. or paint the walls and you're, you know, it's very not limiting to me the, because I used to think that to be an artist, you had to traditionally paint beautiful paintings, which my husband is an artist. He can do, you can put a block of clay and he'll do something that would rival the best sculpture I've ever seen. He can take a picture and it's amazing. It could be like, he's just, he's an artist. He can paint a realistic painting. He can paint an abstract painting. He can, he just, he can write. And I'm not that way. I can't paint. I can barely, my handwriting stinks. Like I so see, you'd, you'd see yourself as I'm a creative. designer. I see myself as a creative and a designer. I'm not so sure I see myself as an artist, but then again, when you start looking at it, I'm not sure there's any way to really define it. And I think that when you try and define it, it's just listening to one person's definition of what they think an, art, an artist or being creative is, but that might mm -hmm. not be what someone else's definition is. So, right. you know, I think anyone, and I think that so many, like I watched my son had a friend over and you could tell that his parents were kind of pushing him more into sports and, you know, they were even saying, oh, you know, he'll, he'll be working around in the back and he, you know, he won't be in the front as the creative. And I'm like, why not? You know, maybe he might be more into sports, but he could absolutely have some creative streak. Everyone has it in you. And especially when you're in a kid, when you're a kid and then you kind of grow up and it goes away or you feel embarrassed. Oh, what will someone think? Or, uh, who cares? Just be yourself. And that is creativity, I think. Right. But I don't I, know. The, uh, the interesting thing to me, and I, I apologize for anyone who listens to <laughs> this because I kind of repeat myself all the time, I think. I don't know. But um, the I always felt going into the, the relationship with my wife and I that I was creative and she wasn't. She was just a pragmatic problem solver who uh, was highly relational and, and extroverted. I was introverted and more visually uh, creative and and playful in that, but I didn't feel I had an artistic voice at all, um, which is that interesting difference between creativity and and, and Being a artist. Artist, yeah. There's right. a there's a there's a, a voice and a vision behind an artist, a creative. I see. I think that every single person is creative yeah. in their own way. Because when of I look course. at my wife, she uh, is a creative writer. I can't really right to save my life. Right. And she's extreme. What I would consider creativity is the the uh, the per, the openness to go into the the chaos and come back from that experience with something constructive for the rest of us. Exactly. So as a creative, you can do that in numbers. As an accountant, you can do that yep. in food, in dress, in interior design. You can do that in art and everything else as a tool to show and communicate your voice as an artist. You work creatively. And of course, you can be an artist and be creative. Can you yes. be creative and be an artist? Yes. Can right. you, you know, it's like. See, but I think everyone is is creative. They I just agree. have their way. And like I my, think they talk themselves out of being creative as you get, like I said, you know, this, this child my son's friend his mom was telling him already kind of you know who's a great mom by the way if they are listening or whatever but you know telling him oh he you know why not he could be the star of the play you know i think you tell mm -hmm. yourself you kind of pound yourself down i don't know how to draw so i'm not creative i, I can't right. paint so i'm not creative was this the kid that was athletic yeah he was more if, athletic if you yeah. look at there's this skater andy anderson I think that I'm getting his name right, but the the things that this kid physically does on on a board with two wheel with two trucks and four wheels is just mind blowing. Yeah, like a dancer. The creative. Yeah, I, it, like it, it's so I don't think you can really define. And I mean, I think that maybe some people try to define it, and and maybe in some ways. But yeah, I mean, I think that as long as you're living your life the way, and I think I think. I really like to give back. I think that, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not like, 
a physicist. I'm not doing something to really change the world. So no, if no, I no, can't no, no. do that's that. Not, that's not true. You are. But but maybe you could change the world. I guess what I'm saying is you can't do it in the way, but maybe you could change the world in making someone happy when they go into their bathroom and they wash their, they have to wash their hands or kids like enjoying to actually have speckled soaps in the shower. Or, you know, there are lots of ways you can creatively affect people and make them happy and mm -hmm. be a positive person in our universe. But see, like the, the soaps and everything that you guys are creating, I've never seen stuff like that in that realm of like candles and soaps and stuff. And I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge consumer sure. of these things. I'm sure they're sure. similar, but it's, you know, to look at your website, it's like, whoa, this is really cool. I want that little moment of playfulness right. next to my sink when I go in there. That, that does something to my day. Like right. A doctor, That's what we're going for. Yeah. Got a it. doctor <laughs> is going to maintain and preserve my life. Right. But it's it's doubtful that that same doctor is going to have the time or influence on my life to interject something in that might be that thing that causes a little thought that then makes me act a little differently and make a different choice. Like these are these are different things that influence our lives that are you know sometimes diminished or dismissed one way or the other right. like someone could say you know an accountant's just this and they're only serving a bureaucratic demand by government and blah 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 or a doctor's just that or an artist can do this but doesn't influence that and the value who's to say what the value exactly. is exactly we'll say someone here or you know anywhere and they have kind of a plain bathroom and it's white and it doesn't that's it's, my bathroom just, and I want your and it has, Well, you got it. Um, <laughs> awesome. And it has, you know, you want to change it up. You want a little bit of excitement, but, you know, you don't want to paint your walls. You don't want to hang up permanent wallpaper, but you want something a little like jazzy. You want a little something extra. And so you put a speckled soap in. You have that one soap in a white bathroom and you can transform it. And that's kind of where, where we started. That was kind of our point of... I guess back in the day when we were doing interiors in New York, we would go and go buy our favorite candle and as a little goodbye treat to our friends who we were doing their apartments, so we'd leave a candle on Walk there. me through or what you so do for friends' apartments in Brooklyn. You would go in for a shoestring budget. And we would get, go in. Like, they would stuff. They would usually something. be friends or friends of friends. So they already yeah. had a leg up on the uh kind of the negotiation on price <laughs> like <laughs> and we were and I worked you know I was working full-time anyway so we this was kind of our side gig so we would go in and we would find everything from in this you know we would find it off the streets and we'd repurpose it and we had our columns so it kind of we would take stuff that we would make from our column and we would we did like four or five apartments that way and some of them made it into like design magazines and press. I forget which, if it was, I don't know. But anyway, we made it, John, <laughs> no, he's shaking his head. But, um, <laughs> but after that, then we just kind of, from there, it was just, we were putting so much into ourselves. Like we were hand doing the stencils on the wall. We were hand doing wallpaper. We were repurposing couches to make them look like, um, you know, Asian from a certain dynasty period. We were doing all sorts of crazy stuff and it was killing us financially. And <laughs> then we moved to Maine and then it just kind of dried up. So thus we were like, when we got to Maine, we were like, what do we do to stay here and not have to move back to New York? And, and, um, now why, why walk me through that? Why did you want to stay in Maine? This because you know, I wanted to get out of New York. <laughs> well, Maine is this dreadfully um, poor place where business is so hard to do, yet it but seems I wanted, like so many people are coming here that really appreciate it. Yeah, I guess when we moved here, no one was... Uh, that's not true. I wouldn't say no one, but it wasn't as popular yeah. if you moved here around the same time. It wasn't... I mean, I think that people wanted to always move here, but with their jobs, there were a lot of limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think that now... It's it's a lot different. Well, let me be clear with that statement too before everyone thinks I'm, you know, taking a big poo poo on Maine. I <laughs> yeah. I moved here because I I visited and I saw how how, beautiful. how beautiful, amazing and the the lifestyle that you can live here 
and and the cost of living. I mean, the taxes are high. I didn't think the cost of living was all that wonderful. When well, I, I mean, here, to be honest. you went to Portland. That was I your moved fault. to the old port. So, <laughs> and, and at first we were like, oh, this is a you know decent price, and now I'm sure it is. But yeah. but, uh, but coming from Brooklyn, you know, Anything's, we were like, oh, yeah. it's a great price. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was so so. But um, yeah, I mean, coming to Maine was like. Just a dream because I wanted to get out of New York. I didn't – I wanted a place. No, why was that? Um, I was there for close to 12 years and I was working full-time for in advertising design. It was a very intense work environment and I thought, why not start my own company and make it twice as intense, <laughs> which is what we did. And it was – and it, actually, I would have to say that our company is – 10 million times harder than any job I ever worked in New York. And that was really hard. So it's, it hasn't been like a cakewalk by any stretch. Now, is there, is there a degree of regret in that with how incredibly difficult this is? And if it is even more difficult, why is it more fulfilling and better? Um, the, there would be no, if I died tomorrow, I would be so happy I did this. I would never regret it. Now Um, it's harder. Why is it better? It's because in the end, it will be so much more satisfying and it's it's so much more satisfying than, and I do have it to compare to. I did work for other companies. Mm -hmm. I was a designer in other places. Um, There's nothing to compare with, with working for yourself and being your own boss. And it's not like I'm sitting around twiddling my thumbs being creative all the time because it's actually... I'd there's say, a lot of minutia and, and technical things that have to be done. There's or, all minutia. It's all technical. It's all production. I can name every single Netflix series, documentary and movie, Amazon, Hulu, Criterion Collection, everything. I know it all because all we do is make stuff all the time, mm-hmm. but non-creatively. So when we get creative time, that is awesome. Like we just finished our liquid soaps and – um it took like it's they're going to be launching in like two weeks, but they took forever. Ooh. But we had so much fun. John drew the label. How, I can did you the design. Uh, verbally walk me through what liquid soaps like, how they're packaged and how they look and all that? If if you're sure, open to yeah, yeah. Um, we're really. <laughs> it's so funny. We're really I, excited I thought about, about that this. when I looked at your site that you. Have <laughs> Why don't these they have bars? liquid soap? I know everyone has been asking us for about five years since the comp- since this portion started to do it, and I mean, I guess it took a global pandemic to um, light the fire under us to get us <laughs> to do it. But, but we finally it's, did it's it. It's very interesting to me. We're talking about a very boring substrate of yeah. candles, soaps, and stuff. But I am I am interested in like, are, how are they going to do liquid soaps? Right, right. Why am I interested in that? There's something exactly. with your creativity in your vision that you've put into this product. Because you can take creativity and put it into- Anything. Anything and make it interesting because it's not about the product. It's about the thought you put into the product, really. And of course, then you have to have a- It is about the product. The product has to be a, a fantastic product. Right. But it's it's equally. You've got to clear the technical hurdles, about, but you've created something that that adds something to life more yes. than just the act of yes, your hands are clean. Like go on your brand. day. Like when you buy it, it's buying a piece of kind of I guess in a way it's our lifestyle brand at this point because it's so much of us. Um, like with the liquid soap. We kind of have our brand set, so we kind of knew it, but we were like, at first, I'm like, we're doing this. We're doing the paper bottles. We are going to revolutionize liquid soap. We got paper bottles in, and they failed so miserably. So I'm like, okay, no paper (laughs) bottles. Um, Okay. They actually had plastic inside the paper bottle. So why are you? um, It's called virtue signaling. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So then we 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 found it's just very big. Ba- it's more again about the design. It's just white basic bottle, but it was all about the design. John drew it, heavily influenced by Pucci, the sixties, the seventies. Um, it's just really cool. It's my favorite design of all the things we've designed so far. I'm just excited. I'm cool. really excited. And yeah, why are you excited about liquids? So- I don't know. It's liquid soap. I yeah, don't know. but you've you I you're know. you're you're acting as an artist with your <laughs> your substrate being soap and candles and everything else, and right. you're you're 
you're giving art to this, you know, you could just have a bland bottle with some stuff that cleans your hands. Right. Or, you know, a bland bar that or cleans Or we your could hands. have gone the Chanel route, which every other company likes to do, which there's nothing wrong with it. It's the kind of in studying, I am a designer, so I do study the, you know, the trends and, and that sort of thing. And it is very trend forward to kind of have your product look very, um, like it could be next to Chanel, like it's very beautiful, it's luxury. And that isn't, <laughs> we're more Biba back from the seventies. We're more, I, it's just not us. I, I tried that and maybe we would even sell more. I have no idea, but in the end we went for a much more personal way, at least personal to us that mm -hmm. I'm not knocking. It would be very personal to maybe a different brand. But mm -hmm. I think what we tried to do with our brand was really not even what we tried. It just happens. It's just turns out to be another face of what we are uh, of us of our mm. of us i guess so we've been talking for i don't know how long and we haven't even gotten <laughs> to the first question so. oh my god <laughs> i'm so people are like <laughs> no no this, when that <laughs> when that out. happens that's a really good thing because you have two people discussing things that they're interested in and can't right. make can't stop making comments on so that's right that's i'll try thing. and keep it I'll, no no I'll no 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 no, no. go off the rails okay. off the rails is great because okay. that's how we get here Okay. Uh, so for for the people who are listening to this who don't know anything about you yep. or your product, does, uh, describe your design ethos. Um, design ethos. John? <laughs> I, just got, I would say it's like, I don't know. I mean, I would say kind of anything goes, but I would... I mean, I would definitely say it's heavily, heavily, heavily 70s influenced. It's mm -hmm. our favorite time period. I say our because it is, John is my, we're kind of like the same almost person. It's so, I'm sorry I'm saying our, but it, it's mine. Um, yeah, I would say it's like 70s. I would say it's fun, cheerful, optimistic, colorful, bright, um, bold, mm -hmm. graphic, visual. Um, happy, playful, fun, eclectic. In in all those, uh, like, like if I had to, it, it would it would be like a, a a really sour in in the good way on the candy sour, you know, like a yeah. It, it's like a it's not there's a little party going on. <laughs> well, well, and it's not mainstream. No, it's not mainstream. Like there aren't too many designs I think that are designing like it. I mean. There are, but I, I mean, I would say personally, it's it feels different. like it's a leading edge kind of thing to me. I, that's very nice of you. I mean, that would be the end goal of it. But I mean, again, it's just kind of like we throw it out there and kind of hope for the best because it's the only way we know how to design. <laughs> like, and I have to say, as a former designer for other people, mm -hmm. I design so much better for ourselves than for yeah. anyone else. Like, it's well, just so much easier. I would so much rather have something that I interact with that someone has honestly had a single singular vision in creating that I then interact with rather than I mean I'm a that's yeah. not gonna sell well across the spectrum of what currently is selling. We need to, you know, tone that down. Yeah, do, you know. I could never really and that was just it. Like when I designed in advertising, we worked for like I mean, I worked for like big companies and it was I never, I was always so stressed if they were going to like it or not, or, you know, if, if not stressed really in the end, you don't care, but I, like you do. And you're kind of this with us, it's just a lot more true. It's like, I'm just like kind of putting it out there and we really do hope that everyone likes it. But if they don't, we hope that enough people do, you know, that maybe we're not for everyone, but maybe we're for enough people in, in the kind of the people that like our style. I, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be just fun. <laughs> Thank you. So why are you interested in decorative arts and design? I just always have been. I mean, my influence, I grew up, um, with my parents, we, they only had antiques. So I grew up going to flea markets, garage sales. Um, I never went to like Young's furniture and bought a bedroom suite or whatever. We, everything was always mismatched, but in a very actually country, country antique 
way. Mm -hmm. And so I went the total opposite of that with mid-century modern and in that sort of thing. But it always was in me. It just kind of changed from I went the opposite of what my parents were. Really. Sure. Doesn't everyone. Doesn't everyone rebel. <laughs> if they would have done mid-century, I probably would be um, – doing country living right now or something like that. <laughs> With country crock spread. Exactly. The, um, Butter the... churn. <laughs> um, where do you find your inspiration and, and what does that feel like to you when it, when it hits you? Um, I find my in inspiration from anywhere. It could be in clothing, fashion, um, furniture, design, vintage uh, magazines, um, vintage books, um, vintage clothes. I like minerals. I love jewelry. Pretty much anything I look at, I can I can find it in your uh, baseball cap there, yeah. or or not because it's McDonald's colors. You got the blue and the red going yeah. on. But oh, yeah, no, you can. But no, I'm I'm totally just I, kidding. I I'm totally, totally just kidding. <laughs> I bought this hat because we were going across the country uh, in our well our monster truck with um with a camper on the back. Oh, cool. Uh, you have a camper? We had a slight... Well, I, I bought this diesel truck from a friend's brother who it already had this lift and big tires on it. Uh -huh. And my two boys were like, oh, so cool. And oh, I was like, boy. All right, whatever. <laughs> but we needed it to be able to haul a, a, a certain weight amount. Like, right, So we needed right. this big diesel truck. And then I was like, well, we got this truck. It sure would be cool to have a sliding camper and maybe we could go on a road trip. And so we we left like January and went across the country to California and back. How cool. But that was right during the inauguration of uh, Biden and right. Trump leaving office. And I was in like, you know, my in-laws and everyone, like, uh. a lot of people were <laughs> like, I don't know, this is a good time. It's yeah. civil war and, and everything else. And I was like, all right, uh, maybe if I get this hat and that truck, we are going to be going through the South. I'll fit in and no one will bug There me. you go. Perfect. So I got my Bass Pro Shop hat and I am I can go incognito. So. My dad has his <laughs> captain's license and um, is a fisherman, hardcore. He grew up on the Jersey Shore. So yeah. I'm very familiar. I'm not a fisherman myself, I but I'm very familiar with Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> very familiar yeah. with all of it. <laughs> yeah, we, we saw some real big snapping turtles in, in a couple of them. Cool. But, uh, so you're a bit of a collector, I hear. Tell us I about sure your am. first collection. Uh, from when I was a kid or from when I was- Very like, first collection that you remember collecting. Probably more. dolls. I mean, yeah. I collected dolls growing up. and But I mean, I'm just, I am honestly, I thought if I ever did do a book again, it would be about collecting because- what is it with I'm collecting? Insane. Like what, I, I think what about it? COVID has made me an insane collector. And I think John can actually say yes in the background to that. Uh, yeah, he's <laughs> nodding his <laughs> My husband but, can verify um, that. I don't know. I mean, it's just, I think people either have it in them or they don't. And I but have like it in for you, what is it when you you have one, but you want another one, but maybe not exactly the same, slightly but different, some, but it's yes, similar and like yeah. you keep doing that. Yeah. Like what is it in the psychology and the process I of wish collecting? I, knew. I, I honestly, I don't know. I know that John has it. I know that either I have friends that have it and I have friends that don't. And I'm not really sure hmm. what makes certain people enjoy it. I think maybe you have to enjoy Maybe the history of things. Maybe you have to enjoy objects. I don't know that you could be a minimalist and be a collector, although maybe you could. Your collection of zero. <laughs> uh, but for me, I, I definitely, minimalist is not within the realm of collecting for me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of my collections are not cheap either, which, and I'm not a millionaire. So go figure. Yeah. It, it's a lot of swapping and selling and, you know, um, I wonder if I should start a, I don't, I've oh, never so collected, but I wonder if I should like <laughs> dedicate one small portion yeah, of a wall do. in my I home. I think that's the key with collect and see for me, it's not only collecting, but part of the joy of it is finding the cases to put the collections to find <laughs> how you're going to just, oh no, I mean, that is like almost like I just had lighting shipped from, uh, Korea or Japan, they're the same lights that museums use, only um, 
they've managed to make them in a mini form like this oh, big, cool. but they're the legit lights. And I'm, I, I mean, I have like cabinets and I mean, I just go, I go crazy. What are you, what are you uh, using those lights on? <sighs> John. Right now, um, he's just, it's so funny. I'm trying to engage him. He's not doing it. Um, <laughs> he's letting right you go now, solo. Well, I have a bunch of different, I, I collected jewelry, minerals. I collected like mm. fine mineral specimens, crystals. Um, and now I'm collecting, um, they're called Sobu, S Sofu. <laughs> Christ, Sofu. They are... Um, Soft vinyl dolls from Japan, and Whoa. they're really, really cool. They're called smart dolls, and they're like – they're just one of my I, – I just love them. They're like made how they used to make toys back in the 60s. They're like the vinyl. They have that like vinyl smell to them that like old vintage toys have. Right. But they're kind of like anime, and you can change them. You can change their like busts and their – but anyway, I decided that um, they're not really – they say they're for kid. No kid is buying. They're too expensive. They're like collector's dolls for like kind of art doll. I don't know what they are, but I started making mini shoes for them. And I'm you started so, making mini shoes for them. Yeah, I'm making one third scale size flip flops right now. And they're being they're so cool. And I'm sending them to my friends and they're like, these are really cool. I may actually make a flip flop. Uh, I may actually do a flip flop line if i can get these looking really cool i don't know like a, a, a like a flip-flop line just for the dolls or like in for the dolls first probably yeah. and then i mean this is not going through our own company <laughs> but um but yeah for them and then potentially for adults too because they're looking really really cool the sandals um because really? the third scale is almost you know a third scale human they're yeah, they're tall yeah. they're 24 inch dolls so wow they're really cool. They're not like yucky dolls. They're they're cool dolls. So <laughs> so, but but they're looking really cool in my shoes. So we'll, we'll see what happens. You I, know, I gotta say, sky's like, the limit. <laughs> you, in in the culture and everything else that I grew up in, I kind of was telling you about. You just don't run into people who would have a conversation about I'm making one third scale sh shoes for <laughs> like these vinyl dolls from Japan, and it's so cool. Like it's it's really. It's just really cool to to be able to interact with someone whose mind is in a place that you'd never gone and to the to feel <laughs> the interest of like holy cow you see the world different. This is amazing. <laughs> right. It's really cool. Well, it's fun. Well, that's why when you say like how do you define something and it's kind of like in the end to sum it all up is I think it's just maybe creativity is just being yourself and not worrying about what other people think and if you want to make one third scale doll shoes and who cares make them and I, maybe you can make some money off so of it I'd, or not i think i disagree with you there a little bit okay in agreeing with you i think creativity <laughs> is is essentially a search for truth okay and I agree in with that. that the process of creativity is one of working through the different possibilities of truth getting closer to what is true and yeah. Each one yes, of us. Exactly. Each one of us has our interests and our things that just make our bells and whistles start going. And in any substrate activity or anything, there's there's possibility and there's truth and there's conflict and there's there's all these things. And just through interacting with them and seeing how you can bring these things together and execute them is in its own way some search for truth. So if it's a kid Yep. skateboarding that's doing things that no one's ever done they've created something through mimicking and pulling processes that other people have done to then change them and make something new kind of like yeah. finding old things but then reusing them and 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 bringing them back to life into our current culture in a new way from the past and and i think i think creativity is essentially a um is a servant to truth and and like you're right. saying being yourself is the most honest thing that that you can do in in finding more about this life that you can in the end illuminate. when when you die no one's gonna look back when you're on your deathbed like you're not gonna look back at joe schmo's life you're looking back at your life 
right. who cares about what anyone else is doing. You want to look back and be like, I'm so glad I made one third scale doll shoes. <laughs> Why not? You know, I mean, seriously, who cares? All right, that's, like, you that's have the quote your only that we son. have to lead this podcast out with. Tim. Oh no! <laughs> when you're on your deathbed and you look back on your life, you are going to be happy. Like today. that's how I do try and look at it, though. That's like awesome. I never want regrets because no one else. And I try and tell that to my son. Like no one else cares about you. They care about themselves. No one's looking at you. They're looking at them. So just do what you want to do and don't care about. And as soon as you can do that, that's when your freedom truly begins. And maybe something comes of it or maybe nothing does, but in the end you're happy. And that's kind of what it's all about anyway. I think, you know, again, I'd, I'd agree with you and disagree (laughs) with you at the same time that that, you're allowed to do that. that, Well, I, I think it's where we get closer to truth, right? Right. But but like what you're saying, I, I I think people, because people look at you and they do care about you because you're different but you're right. different because you're being yourself right and if in your process of being yourself you're not worried about what other people think not caring about other people what they think yeah but if you're being honest to yourself and from yourself but also at the same time caring about others that's where the stop caring about what other people think about you and start caring about others there's that yeah. there's that difference of like I'm I'm not going to put myself in a place where the the judgment and uh, the the thought process of you is going to downgrade me in anything I'm doing, but I'm going to interact with my life and the creativity and everything else that I have as a means of of bettering this existence, but also in as a means of caring about others because I right. can care about others by being honest with myself. Right. Then that it's it's instead of worrying about this direction, worrying it's about not that worrying direction. worrying about what others think of you. It's caring about others feeling good, but it's not worrying about what they think about you as a right. person. Right. There's a difference. Um, and it's funny. I know someone back in my advertising days, they would say they, they had a TV show that was in on the BBC called What is Cool? And it was like defining like what is cool creative, what is like what makes someone cool and da da da. And it was this whole like series based on diving into trying going into watching, you know, Oasis. I don't know who it was, someone back in the day. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I think that what cool is and what this whole show was trying to say is cool is not is just being yourself. I mean, and creative. I mean, I think you can kind of interchange it, but I think you can't really define it because you can't try to be it and you can't, you just have to do it and and not, if you try and define it and you try and be it, then you, you kind of aren't it in a way, you know yeah, what I mean? It, if, if I had to define <laughs> like what cool was, I, I, you know, I think it would be honesty, integrity and, and, uh, confidence in confidence. In and I do think creativity is probably being cool too, to be creative you kind of have to, I mean, you can well, dissect a risk. everything. It's a risk because you're opening yourself up to having people judge you. Yeah, yeah, it is. And people don't like to be judged. Well, that was the the epiphany I had in distancing my, or or not being able to be a part of the culture that I grew up in, the belief culture, is, is that I realized eventually that it, uh, let's see, you, you, there's a process of creativity where you you go into the unknown and experience and then come back to the collective us right. and say, here's what I've experienced and I've been able to turn it into this and I present it to you to see if you value what I've surmised from my experience. That's, that is vulnerability. Yeah, it is. And, and it's also you are in some way presenting change. Potentially, and also which is resisted. And you're also opening yourself up for criticism, yep. which is hard. I mean, I don't know. I speak for myself. I, anytime I hear, I, I never get over being criticized or hearing a negative something. So you're opening yourself up by being yourself. You're also saying no to people. You're saying no, and sometimes that's difficult, saying no when, when you're hurting someone's feelings. You're like, To be yourself, it's kind of all-encompassing, but then it is. It's getting you out to be creative. It's Mm -hmm. getting you out to do. 
But sometimes being true to yourself maybe isn't always the most popular thing too. It's not mainstream. Yeah, it no. never is really being being that way. Um, to be mainstream, you have to give up a lot. I think. I mean, well, in some ways, <laughs> at least in hmm. our type of field, to be mainstream, you get a lot, but you give up a lot too. You give up some of yourself at times, unless hmm. your vibe is mainstream, and then, right. then and, you're cool. Well, but. yeah, you if if your if your creativity is currently mainstream, you are not the cutting edge. And you will become obsolete right. of, of what True. you've discovered eventually, which is is as it should be, and it's, it will it, be. It is the the cycle of life. You know, yeah. you study anything, and there's you know you things go in and things go out. You have to stay ahead of the curve. Is the idea that you have a mindset that constantly is attempting to be out in front of the curve. No, or, see, that's you know? the weird thing. I don't even like necessarily like read quote fashion magazines to see. I just, that's what I'm saying. We do what we like and hope that it works. Mm. Maybe what we like just happens to align with what's in. Maybe what's in kind of morphs in, or maybe it's not even in. I don't know. Well, it, that's I don't even know. an inter interesting conversation. But no, conversation. we're not following trends to try and find our look. Never. Yeah, like it, why opposite, is actually. why is something in or not in? Unless like, what it was is in it? in 1972, <laughs> then I follow it. But no, I don't. I don't follow what's in per se. Um, not that way. No. Hmm. That that's an no. interesting conversation that I don't have a lot to say about because <laughs> I, I don't know much about it. Like yeah, the psychology of but of that's style not to say that what we do doesn't become in or isn't in when we do. But it's never like see, and I can tell to some extent because I used to work in the field of design, I can tell the when a brand is chasing the trend. You can tell. You can mm, see it. You right, can see it. Right. So like, I mean, the portrait that we did of you today, I've seen that treatment other places in different ways. And and I saw it and I was influenced by it. And I was like, I want to attempt something like that as a means of going through the process of creating that as sure. a means of what can I learn from this. But I didn't come up with that myself. You know, well, no one. There's no new. There's no idea. Nothing new under the sun. That's new anymore. There really isn't. Um, it's how you reinterpret it, and it's also giving credit. Like, if you do something that you know, if we we were inspired by, say, Jackson Pollock, we gave him credit. You know, mm. you're allowed to be influenced by designers and in greats or not greats, or you know, you're allowed. You're allowed to have that influence your work. But don't steal it, you know. Right. The, right. That's the difference. And I do see people steal. We've been stolen from. You know, I mean, it happens. It's life. I, I guess maybe you've arrived when people have copied you. But well, I mean, what is know? it? Mimicry is the most sincere yeah. form of flattery. People like to say that when they aren't the ones who have been copied. Right. <laughs> like, but but that is true. That is true. Right. I mean, so mimicry yeah. might be the most sincere form of flattery, but litigation is when going it's to not be... your de design that's being copied. <laughs> yeah, lit litigation will on. be forthcoming but. if you uh, do that too much. Um, Let's see, uh, how have your collections influenced your design for wearing Wary Myers? I mean, I guess I kind of spoke on that. It's just everything. You know, I'll look at something and I'll like the color and then I'll try it out in a soap. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I did a soap based on a t-shirt I had once or, you know, like our peachy coconut soap was based. I used to work way back in the day before I was fired a week later, I think at Maui Surf and Sports. And I did Beachy Coconut based on the Maui Surf and Sport logo that was right. on the t-shirt back in the day. So it really depends, you know, it's very varied. <laughs> Have you ever intentionally gone muted and subtle for a specific um, reason? Yeah, we had some, like we had Whole Foods want to sell us. We've had like some companies, but they haven't um, you know, they've wanted it to be very natural, haven't wanted certain, you know, they don't want fragrance, they don't want this. They don't. So we did a, um, we have one soap that has no fragrance in it and no like um, oxides or dyes or anything. Very pure, very clean, very natural. It's our least selling, so least popular soap we sell. So, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of people out there to, to fill that niche for what they want. So I think we're just going to continue to do our own way and let 
that go that way and we'll just kind of go that way and be true to yourself and be true to ourselves. But we do have, we do have one unscented, clean, natural, every, I mean, it's all, they're all natural, but you know, it's like the, that soap and it's our least popular one. So go figure. figure. Um, (laughs) How does color and scent drive your designs? Um, I'd say color drives it more than we'll pick the color and then pick the scent. I mean, it has to be a great scent, but it's all about color and design. Mm-hmm. Um, and quality, it has to be. You know, it's a great soap, and it's everything is quality. But color drives pretty much the soaps, definitely. Because I color. love the. I saw one on there that you know you have the bar of soap, but then you have these very geometric cube. Yeah, those in are. The, yeah, it, it's the very speckled. neat. To, <laughs> yeah, we did those a few years. That that's been a very influenced design of ours that has kind of taken off throughout other people's. But you know, again, but there were tiles that were designed like that in the seventies, and and you know, we've you know, you 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 take your influences and you run and you go with it and hope that it looks good. And the speckled soaps of been hugely popular so yeah as soon as i saw it i was like "Ooh, yeah (laughs) that's different yeah they're fun so to to try and dig into your creative process and and what has you know uh formed and and created this this very cool stuff you got going on uh what uh are are thinking and feeling for you are they different processes no no they they uh they are they one are one in the same one in the same yeah thinking so, and feeling yeah feeling and thinking no no different no for difference. you interesting <laughs> no, no and so you couldn't answer the question if you had if you had to only be able to keep one I, or the other it's and lose really the other. hard for me um it's funny. I worked with my dad, who's a hardcore business guy, and he was helping just with business stuff because we're artists. And and it was really hard. It was really hard. It's really hard to think that way for for me. For John, it's almost impossible. Hmm. Um, so, but yeah, what was your? Well, I mean, like, there, there's this. There's... I can't. So yeah, no, I'm feeling, thinking. I'm all emotion but but not emotion like crying all the time that kind of emotion but like deep thought about everything Mm -hmm. a a, a highly intuitive thought process Mm -hmm. goes on in my head so i mean when you're when you're going through a garage sale or flea market or you know looking for inspiration sure it would be feelings that hit you yeah only yeah feelings everything's feelings like I'll gravitate toward an object and John will be like, well, how did you even see, you know, it's just like, it's weird. I have, it's weird. I've had dreams where I've been like, we're going <laughs> to, the night before I woke up and I said to John, we're going to find a pair of Air Jordans, like the eighties mm-hmm. Air Jordans. And we had been looking, I don't know, he likes sneakers. So oh, yeah. we, like the original and we had been, it was kind of our Holy grail kind of, you know, like to find him. One day I woke up and I said, we're going to find him. And we went to a yard sale that morning. It was a Saturday morning. And there was a pair of the 1980s Air Jordans. I mean, we'd been looking for him for, so I don't wow. know. I don't know if there's this like inner universe connection with me and like finding stuff at like these, what a talent. I don't know, but okay, I can so find what did, stuff. What did you do with the Jordans? John, I think he wore them once and they peeled, they cracked because they were so old. They cracked. So the value went, Uh, not that we bought it for, you know, but just for him to have in his collection. Have you guys seen the like online guy, the guys that will like totally refurbish old sneakers? I believe so. Yeah. Those are, those are pretty cool. It's like a whole thing in itself where they'll like recondition the leather and oh yeah yeah and... yeah oh it's big it's, yeah it's big business yeah, yeah. i've uh <laughs> i i just recently have begun to war have begun to be able to wear shoes that aren't special like orthopedic plantar fasciitis shoes like my right yep. foot <laughs> freaked out and i just had this one brand of shoes that i could wear and i hated it because i'm I, like I really visually, I want to see nice shoes nice when I shoes. look down that I like. I mean, not nice, but yeah. And I yeah. was limited to this one brand that had very stodgy, bleh, and 
it was just killing me. And my kids started skating in the last year and I've been trying to skate in these other shoes that are too thick. And, you know, and we just went to the van store and I was like, all right, I'll just get some and I'll only wear them, you know, when we're skating. Hopefully it won't kill my feet. I don't think fans are good for it. Does, for, they're not killing my feet. Really? I've been wearing them for like a week now. Okay. And and I'm I'm like singing praises. Like I I think plantar fasciitis comes and goes, yeah. I guess. And yeah. I guess it's gone. And I'm very happy about it. My vanity it's is something to celebrate. Yes. Yes. It's the small victories. But <laughs> so the it's interesting to me, like I've found in my own life experience, like the 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 process of feeling and the process of thinking for me have been very two very different things. To grow up in a in a culture that that puts feelings in a place where you need to very strongly uh regulate, control, and question feelings with your cognitive thinking ability. And that they shouldn't necessarily be set wild and free together, right? That Where'd you grow up? Uh, just in a highly religious uh, mindset and oh, setting okay. it, it, or culture. My, I would say that my parents were liberal for the culture, uh-huh. uh, but the culture in itself was was highly um, just uh, very literal. Mm-hmm. In, in its understanding of what's beyond, extremely mm-hmm. literal, everything, answer for everything and everything known, okay? Not, not, not hardly even believed in, in my experience of it, but more known, mm-hmm. which gives you this false impression of, no, I know this to be true, rather than I believe it to be true, but I can't hold it as a fact. Right. It's a, that's a, that's a it's subtle intu- difference. You, you kind of never learned how to trust your intuition in a way, or you hmm. listen to fact and more um, just what is there in front of your eyes and not what is below. I think, I think maybe more so. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's still something that I'm trying to pull apart, but I, I know that, thinking and feeling are two very different processes. And I've Mm. recently found that in, like I found emotions to be my native tongue. It's the thing I understood before I could think that Mm -hmm. we all understand before we can cognitively form words to express those emotions. We understand the emotions as a child before we can say, there's a pin sticking in my butt from this diaper. Can you please get it out? You understand I'm feeling right. pain. It's bad. My emotions are this. And I look towards that. And that's love and empathy. And I I aim myself towards that. And I make a noise that expresses this emotion that I'm. But later in life, you figure out like, hey, mom, this diaper, the Velcro is killing me now or something. Right. Right. So there's this different thing of thinking and feeling that that are two different processes where if I were to imagine myself walking around a flea market, I'd be having an experience where emotions are the first thing that hit me. And once I receive these emotions from I don't know where, my cognitive mind then says, well, yeah, that's a really interesting, um, you know, little spaceship that looks like it's from the 50s, but it's actually a recreation from the 90s to look like it was from the 50s. Cognitive (laughs) mind says no good, you know, and there's right. There's that weirdness of of emotion combined Maybe with feeling. Maybe collectors, thinking. like when you were asking about like you're not a collector. Maybe collectors think more on a level of, oh, I'm gonna buy it. It's a space, and they don't break it down like you're saying how you break it down. Maybe, maybe. collectors are more irrational almost. Maybe maybe there's a bit of just go and buy it like a bit right. of craziness. There's got to be some. There's <laughs> I will say there is a bit of cra- at least with me, but obsessiveness. I mean, yeah, yeah. Do you get into auctions online for certain stuff like that, or is I, it? Yeah, I mean, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to an auction. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Are you we going it. to see you on an episode of Hoarders? Someday? No, <laughs> that is one thing, but that's the weird thing because of my organizational um, ability. You won't because everything I have a saying, if it doesn't have a home, it's not allowed to roam. If we find something and it is just going to sit on a table, it has to go. If it doesn't mm. have a place to go, 
it can't just sit around. So no, I, 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 I hoarding will not be in my future. So when, no. when you're walking around looking at stuff that inspires you, you like it, but you also know I need a place where that, yes, yes. That I think I think if you or... don't have that, in then you could then you could become a hoarder. Yeah. You have to see the end result. Where is it going to go? Hmm. What is it? Oh, gonna, yeah. I I treat photography that way. That's really cool that you made this connection for me. So I do not go out with a camera and just randomly shoot. Uh -huh. I, I never do. I if I. I always go with a preconceived intent of what I'm going to be doing. So maybe when I'm when I'm when I'm working creatively singularly from myself, I preconceive what I'm going to go do. Like I've got the place in my house where this thing is going to go. Right. I preconceive an idea of why am I taking this camera with me? What am I trying to say or what am I trying to capture? But with looking at things at like, say, a flea market or whatever, you can't have that because you don't know what you're going to find. But you can look at where it's going to go. See, you right. have what you're going to do first. Right. Know? Like, I I feel like I have gone out and wandered with a camera because I've seen friends who are artistic and good photographers do it and create good things. Uh but when I go and do it, I have this feeling of I'm simply creating work for myself and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Right. And it pr produces an anxiety in me. Whereas if I pre, you know, pre going out and doing anything, if I say, all right, I want to go out and I'm going to attempt to get to see what I can abstract with photography in the woods. Like there's an end goal here. Right. I'm going to make something around this subject i'm going to try and do that you have your theme or your direction or right like you're the end goal yes of where you're going to put it in right. your head so to speak it's right but there. i but i don't go out and simply uh hoard imagery that i just put on a card and right. then store and then maybe do something with right that to me is like i'm piling an anvil above my head and i'm gonna have to deal with it later right yeah, yeah. It, so, it could Sort of the same. Photographic oh. hoarding. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to help. Glad to help. So um, how does thinking and feeling work in your creative process? As you said, they're strongly, strongly inseparable for you. Yeah, they're, they're inseparable. So it's, it's more like, does this feel right? Then let's do it. Mm -hmm. Does this look right? Let's do it. You know, it, it, it's just... Like when we, to put it into an example, when we were doing the labels for the liquid soap, um, John was coming up with a bunch of illustrations that were one, great, but I'm, I, you know, it's like, no, it's not, it's not good enough, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> which is so rooted, like only that John and I. That is the creative process. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no getting around it. Like, and he doesn't, we, neither of us have tough skins, but we can be tough with each other so but it would just be like no not it's not and then all of a sudden he did it and th the one that worked and it was like that's it you there got it, it. and it, but how can you define that how can i define that to you when i knew what worked and what did i can't it's a feeling mm -hmm. right i can't define it you right. know and maybe that's why working like with other people versus working for yourself you're always a little more creative with yourself because you have that like Got it. But when you're working for someone else, you don't get that. I got it because you have to run it by them mm. to get that. I got it. Right. You and know? So I that, nailed it for me, but did I nail it for them? So in the so, liquid soap example, John was kind in a, in a way working to present to someone else to say, is yeah, this what we want Yeah, he's presenting to me. It was. It is kind of like how I used to work back in advertising. You know, you work with an illustrator. They bring you the design. You look at it. You make alteration. You tweak it. You think it works. It doesn't. You. So that's. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That probably so that is kind of how we work as a team you know on a smaller scale and then unfortunately i have to be the bill collector i have to do the books or you know we have a lot of jobs where we don't necessarily love it but that's one where we do it and it is all feeling based mm. it's even with business like if someone is on a 30-day 
credit, I have to kind of go to my feeling like, okay, should we do a business to say, will this store pay us in 30 days? A lot right. of things you have to use your instinct on. It's in, in business and hmm. I, I don't find, know. I find that a lot when we're uh, shooting architectural spaces that it'll be myself, my assistant and the client and anyone else on their team standing there looking at the iPad, looking at what we're looking at and feeling it. Yeah. And, and then trying to discuss this doesn't feel right because this apex of that is coming into the the corner of that and it doesn't feel right and we'll move it and then we'll see how it feels. And we're constantly That's what yeah. There's not constant. a lot of words you can say at that point. And I found on the last shoot that we were doing that we'd we'd uh shoot we or we'd look at it live and, and then we'd adjust some stuff and everyone would go, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> there's no articulated <laughs> Yeah. Words as much as there's like, mm, eh, you know, like there was yeah, just these ex expressions of emotions that weren't articulated, but we're like, all right, we're getting there, you know, and it that's how I think it must be that way with every creative process, because I do that with it. I lay out the type and it will be three lines of type and it should be so easy and it looks so easy. And when I get done with mm. it, it looks like anyone did it. I mean, it's so right. simple, but to get the that's simplicity. So much fun. It's it's fun, but it's so difficult. It will take me weeks to get like a two freight, you know, like two a lineup of type to look mm -hmm. pretty together. And you know, it looks like you could just do it so easily, but it, it it isn't. And but to say when I look at it and say it doesn't work, I can't explain what doesn't work about it. I just mm -hmm. look at it and I'm like, it doesn't look as good as I know it could. But on the end result, you could do that indefinitely. Right. And that's the problem a lot of times in our company. We have so many great ideas that have never even been done because you just keep improving them and then they just never get done. <laughs> so, you know, you have to actually stop the process at some point and actually do it and say it's as good as we want it to be right. and be happy right. with that. Because you can always get, you can always do better. Right. And that's the problem. There are, I forget the exact quote, but there was someone that was talking about music production and that they said that they don't ever really uh, finish, finish a, a song. song. They just, they get to a point where they feel it can be released. You know? Yeah. And it's not like you're not going to get perfection here because if there's perfection, that be means better. that there was a definition of what that should be. And there's exactly. not a definition of what that should be to be able to be perfect. It's simply an expression that uh, is is fitting for what you're expressing. And we've gotten to, yes, that is an encapsulation of what I'm expressing, and that is good, and that is it, rather yeah. than perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, that's, it's true. I guess, I guess we need to tell ourselves, don't go for perfection. <laughs> right. Yeah, because that Don't is an interesting point that I'm realizing that if if something can be perfect, then that does mean that whatever you're creating is not original. Right. Because if it could be perfect, that means something came before and set the standard of what this thing now that you're creating should be. Right. And if that were the case, you don't need to create that. Right. If, it's and already... if you were, you were you were simply doing mimicry. And that's right. not what you're doing. You're creating something new. So there is no perfection in creating something new. Interesting. Yeah. You should have been a philosopher. It I, is I, my <laughs> absolute passion I can, at this point. And I'm such a novice and un, like, I don't know anything about it, but it's so I fascinating. I think you'd be really good at it. Yeah. What, what do you, how am I going to pay for anything with <laughs> yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of not making that much money um philosophy might be a might not <laughs> right? be yeah no, but that that's a really or, like my but, kind of getting goosebumps right now <laughs> that that's true like if if perfection is possible it's already been done and yeah there's no point in trying to create something to match that either mimic it or be okay with that you are creating something new and it cannot be perfect. I think if people looked at it that way, I think a lot more would get done, at least our company, a lot more would get done because, or mm -hmm. just to have a time limit. I think maybe in a creative field where you work for yourself to set time limits are really yeah. good because we were just going on and on with our labels. And finally I said, today's the day. I'm just, we're sending it out. And, and even to the, the 
final hour we were doing little like, you know, you just have to stop. Right. <laughs> just let <laughs> just it go. stop. Let it go. Let it go. Well, yeah. um, man, I can't stop thinking about this idea of perfection now. It's always bothered me that <laughs> Can people- Can you write it? Well, you don't need to write it down. It's, um, yeah, it's here and we've recorded it. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to it. But that's just so interesting that what it means if perfection is possible is that it's already been done and it's been defined and established as the touchstone. Would that yeah. be the right? And I like the fact, and I really like, and as a result of that, maybe- just don't try and achieve perfection, but try mm. and achieve almost perfection. Uh, try and achieve. What um, is it that's wrong with mimicry? Like, what it, do you mean mimicry? Like, uh, so I'm I'm trying to work mimicking? with this idea of um, it, if there is, it always comes back to this for me uh, because of this stuff in my life. But if there is, let's pretend there's a god for argument's sake. And there's some way of interacting with it. Yeah. Okay. What's the benefit? We have to like create that or make it up. I don't know. But if, if, uh, if, if moral mimicry is the point, well, we've already kind of established good morals and we're still kind of fighting over that. And then we're breaking it down, but we're keeping some morals. But this, this idea of, what really changes you as a person? Is it, do you want your child to mimic you or do you want your child to be who they are while being influenced by a good relationship with you? That's the thing. I don't want my kids to mimic me. No. I want them to be their own person while being uh, formed in their character through relationship because relationship allows freedom, complete freedom while taking the best parts of influence through relationship that they choose to put into their own life. Right. And if, if someone's mimicking me, like if I had a neighbor that simply mimicked me, I'd be like, you are weird and I do not really want to interact with you. But if I had a neighbor that I had a relationship with that um, I saw them change parts of their life that were influenced by me and I changed parts of my life that were influenced by them. That's really beautiful. Yeah. But mimicry is striving for perfection in some way. Is it? I don't know. It depends on who you're mimicking. What if you're mimicking someone that's not striving for perfection? Hmm. Well, you're still, if you're mimicking, you're still trying to exactly replicate them in their imperfection and it's still disingenuous but right we're going in deep here <laughs> that is like, <laughs> <laughs> like really? Maybe, we John. might not be uh we might not be uh at the pay grade for this i don't know but that's podcast two, <laughs> podcast two. <laughs> Part two. before we lose every single viewer here let's wrap this up um so I'm going to answer this question for you and you tell okay. me if I'm wrong because I think you already answered, but your favorite okay. decade is the 70s yep. and it has inspired your work because you were at a point in your life, I'm guessing, where you maybe had the most wonder and ability to absorb everything around you. Yeah. And that's, to, to me, uh, when you look at compositions looking into a space, when the when the height of the camera is low, like as in the camera's only like two feet off the ground, it feels far more intimate and people naturally gravitate towards that. It, it's more feeling. And if you put the camera up higher, it feels more informational. And if I relate that to my life, when I was this tall, everything mm-hmm. had more wonder in it because I didn't have as many memories that influenced my mind to tell me what I should preconceive about what I was experiencing. So I, in those moments, I didn't know what to expect and I was more open and welcoming in those moments to be influenced by that moment, by that setting, by that time, by that culture. I still deal with that. For you, 70s. Yeah. And so those things are now coming back. Yeah, nostalgia. And and, um, yeah, I forget, we were talking to someone recently 
in an interview and they they said like who makes your buy like what makes you decide to buy some? and I said probably 90% nostalgia like really mm-hmm. you know nostalgia plays a huge huge point like oh I remember that or oh and you want to recap you want to recapture that in some way mm. and maybe that's what I'm doing in my business is just recapturing the 70s even though I was you know very very young in the hmm. 70s um maybe that's what i'm trying still to do. though that know. that formative time of your life we intrinsically know as a culture that we have to protect that because it's so vulnerable in so many ways there's yeah. there's that mind of a child that is extremely in in influenceable but I'm it also i think it was the 70s was like i mean it was carefree it was fun there it, it was just a different it was like, you know, there. it was just a different time. It was it, the 80s kind of, you know, toward the end, it kind of just tanked it all. And then we had the 90s. But um, I don't know. It just seems like the 70s were kind of let it all hang out. People did what they want. They, it was crazy fashions, colorful, bright, crazy hairstyles. It, it, it all just like free and wild and crazy and different and breaking free from all the opposition that it just was a, it was a great time. I, I, you know, if, if I'm going to go back to any time and try and pull it back into where we are now, that's the time that, that I want to kind of inject into 2021, I guess. Do you think there's a, um, like the sixties were a societal, uh, as, as individuals and collectively as individuals, uh, a push out from what the norm was, and then the seventies took that and more yeah. so embraced it within the n- n- overall normal culture. Yeah, ex- exactly. So it became yeah. a little more. It got. Uh, it became all the people into, in the seventies. They were. Bra- I mean, in the sixties, they were. You know, breaking away from the oppression of the fifties and mm-hmm. breaking away and breaking away, and then. 70s just kind of cracked it all open. Like right, an and, egg, the, and that. It all- that Just, idea, mindset, and aesthetic, and everything else uh, got more so absorbed into the the general style, the yeah. the corporate thing, and everything else too. Yeah, where corporate manifestations of products and everything else began to absorb that sentiment into the designs and and, and if you and out. I mean seventies packaging design is magic. It's magic. It, <laughs> it it really is. I have so many books and so much on it. And I don't know. I mean, you can't say it was boring. You can't say it was boring back then. And if anything, maybe it wasn't as sophisticated as it is now, but it was a lot of fun. Hmm. And I think maybe that's what we need right now is some fun. <laughs> so in a way, let's I feel like let's, here. yeah, let's, <laughs> let's just, and it, it, I think it's coming back. It, it, they always say every year it's coming back, but I do think it, maybe it's back again. Well, we're starting to see bell bottoms on kids again. Yeah. So. Good. Great. The I never thing stopped I don't wearing like them. about that is how dirty they get if they're too long. That's, I know. But you know what? You can get them a little bit shorter. A little in, bit shorter. High fine. water bell bottoms. High water. That's what I'm wearing today. There it's we go. my favorite thing. <laughs> I, I and, and I have to say the whole, no offense to skinny jean wearers, but um, I was the only one through 10 years of in skinny jeans of I was the out, I was wearing bell bottoms and flares and everyone else had skinny jeans. And I was like, I just, this is my thing and soon, maybe not soon, and it wasn't that soon, but they're back. And I'm like, see, they're back again. (laughs) Saved yourself some money. I saved myself some money. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Cool. Well, it's been really fun talking to you. And thank you for taking a boring substrate like candles (laughs) and soap and making them awesome. Well, happy to do it. Happy that, to do super it. Super cool. And Thank I want to see the soft soaps and more stuff out of you guys. Really cool stuff. So Thank you. Well, you never know what's next. Yeah. Soft soap go. or um uh third scale shoes. You just never Hey, know there what we are. Happen. Flip-flops. Yeah, <laughs> flip-flops. These flip-flops are all too small. Wait a minute. They'll <laughs> yes. get bigger. <laughs> They'll get bigger. Cool. Well, thank you for coming down to Biddeford and talking to us. And uh, be sure to catch Linda's uh, 
design theory article in the upcoming issue of Maine Home Design. I forget which uh, month it'll be coming out in. I think July. July. I'm. We'll go with July. July. If it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. It'll, it'll be it'll sometime. Be June, soon. July, or August. We'll say. So. It'll be sometime. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.